In the early centuries of Christianity, there were a number of spiritual thinkers who left the communities of faith in Jerusalem and that area, migrated to North Africa and individually set their life aside to explore God, to learn more, to ponder, to think. They became known as mystics and their writings still exist today under the heading of the Desert Fathers. Over the centuries, the theme of mystics has emerged and disappeared and emerged again, and we're in a season where there are more and more mystics who are speaking loudly into Christianity. And this video is overtly intended to address that dynamic and to create some filters in order to draw out the treasures and to avoid some of the problems that I see emerging through the stream that we call mystics. I'd like to use an unusual background for this discussion, and that's the life of David, and to present David to you as a rebel. Why do I call him a rebel? Well, let's take three scenarios. First of all was the situation with Goliath. He went as a messenger boy to deliver some goods to his brothers, began asking some questions, and was immediately pounced on by his older brothers and scolded for being irresponsible, for being disobedient, for being a lot of things that he vigorously denied. But it was obvious that he was not the compliant, cooperative, obedient child. He had a brand already. You fast forward a little bit later, he's in the wilderness and he sends a message to Nabal saying, would you kindly reimburse me for the unsolicited protection that I offered to your people? And Nabal flashed in fury and said, why should I pay any attention to somebody who rebels against his master and is running around as a whatever in the wilderness? Then undeniably, you have his time as a double agent, where he went over to the Philistines and lied, 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 saying that he was serving the Philistines when he was killing the Philistines. And in order to cover for himself, he was killing men, women, and children. He would commit genocide, annihilating everybody in the villages that he raided so that one single person could escape in order to rat him out. If that's not rebellion, I don't know what you would call it. And against that backdrop, you have the time where that he was in the cave and Saul came in to relieve himself and David crept forward to cut off a piece of his clothing to prove that he had been there and vigorously pushed back against his guys and spoke to Saul and said, I'm going to obey God. I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed. I refuse to kill you when I had the opportunity. So we have this interesting paradox of a lifetime rebel who is profoundly submitted to at least one of God's principles. Now hold that thought and let's follow through the current scenario with mystics. And I'm going to come back to that paradoxical picture of David the rebel who wasn't a rebel, but he was, but he wasn't. First of all, let's contextualize it in this season. In the 1960s, there was the emergence of what was disparagingly called the parachurch movement. At that time, there was a firm belief by the established church that they had a monopoly on all of the grace of God, and anybody that left the established church to begin a ministry outside the church was suspect, was less than, was definitely outside the will of God. And parachurch became a very disdainful term, second-class Christian, definitely not walking in God's will. Now, that tiny stream of people has become an absolute flood in the body of Christ as there's an explosion of ministries in every sector from the marketplace to sports to mercy ministries to the governmental sector. You name it and there are believers that are operating outside the church 
walking with God, not rejecting the church, but saying that their vehicle, their message, their activity, their calling from God needs an organization that is a little bit outside, that honors the church, but is not under the auspices of a particular church. We are living in an unprecedented time in Christian history when there is revelation pouring forth from the heart of God at a level that I do not see anywhere else, even in the early church. We are so blessed to have revelation about inner healing, about deliverance, about God in the marketplace, God in politics, God in the judicial, God in the family, God here, God there. There is an absolute outpouring of revelation. It is a heady time to be a Christian, an extraordinary time to live in this season of revelation. Predictably in this season, there is an extraordinary amount of nonsense being peddled in the name of God, and there is an epic level of greed once again, as in the name of God, shysters are peddling every kind of snake oil, gathering around themselves people that are loyal to them and their supposed message. And in this milieu of massive revelation from God, huge distortion by those that are trying to merchandise God, we have a subset, a stream that call themselves various things. I call them mystics. My definition of a mystic is somebody who seeks revelation apart from the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God. Mystics. What does that look like? Well, there are those that visit the past. There are those that go to the graves of spiritually great people and seek to receive anointing or mantle or authority or power from that dead person into their life. There's others that go to places where God has come, there's been a visitation, and they receive from the anointing that is there. There are those that purport to go into heaven in various forms to receive revelation, not from God, but in other constructs in heaven. There are those that routinely visit with Elijah or Moses or whomever in heaven to receive extra biblical revelation about how they should walk today. There are those that visit with dead relatives. There's a whole field of discussion about the great cloud of witnesses and individuals that summon that group of humans that have already died that are in heaven to come to earth to witness this, that, or the other. That whole movement of engaging with heaven and earth to receive something or another other than directly from the Holy Spirit, from the Word of God. That's what I'm loosely calling the mystic stream that I've been observing for a number of years. I'd like to make three observations about them. First of all, I believe one of the driving forces behind this mystic movement, this pursuit of revelation apart from the Holy Spirit and from the Word of God, is a poverty spirit. There is something not working, there's something not functioning in their lives, and therefore they go looking. This is no different than the drive in the Old Testament for idolatry. I look at the average man, let's say, in Judah under a godly king who was raised worshiping Yahweh, raised going to the temple and performing these sacrifices. And after a certain number of years, he's not able to get what he wants. He's not able to get the family with the sons he wants or the wealth or the position or whatever it is. And in that place of poverty, in that place of perceived poverty, of God not giving what he asks for and what he wants, he starts looking around saying, well, if Yahweh can't or won't, maybe Baal will or Ashtoreth or this or that. And there's the pursuit of personal objective agenda in the silences of God. That is no different than Abraham deciding that in spite of the word of God, the promises of God for a son, God wasn't delivering. Therefore, out of his poverty spirit, he had to go the route of the slave 
concubine, Hagar and Ishmael and all of that drama. So throughout human history, the perception of God not delivering is endemic. I walked there. I walked in a stream of the faith that assured me we had the best theology, we were loved by God, we were the finest Christians, and Christianity wasn't working for me. But in that place of spiritual crisis, God came to me and pointed me back to the word of God, saying that the answers were there, the Christianity, the way he designed it works, but that the religion that I'd inherited had some pieces missing. And he taught me about principles instead of doctrine, sent me back to the word for the revelation that I was looking for. So I'm no stranger to the poverty spirit. I'm no stranger to having sincere faith that is not working, but my solution, my response, has been to deepen my intimacy with God and to pour into my pursuit of the Word of God to see what else is there that I hadn't seen before. So that's my first observation. I'm very concerned about the power of the poverty spirit to pull somebody into pursuits of answers in places where they shouldn't be pursuing. The second issue is that of congruence with the existing revelation. I first ran into this with one of the mystics who claimed he met with God and that God said that when we die, our character is freeze-framed so that when we go to heaven in eternity, we're going to have the same bad character that we had when we died. Well, this runs directly contrary to the whole theology of glorification that has been a significant part of church dogma for the longest time. It runs contrary to Revelation 21 and the bride of Christ that is resplendent in the righteousness of Christ that has been imputed to her. We are not showing up there with our lumps and our bumps and our blacks and our bruises and all of our junk. So as the mystics speak and share, I'm always measuring what they say against the bigger grid of the biblical revelation and saying, hmm, I'm not seeing how that's congruent and that and that and that. So the issue of congruence goes with a poverty spirit and raising a caution flag for me. And the third is the debatable fruit. I look at the lives of the mystics and say, hmm, if you have the best revelation going, if you have this inside information from wherever, why is it working it better? I remember sitting in a living room with a gentleman who was really big into time travel, and he had some very impressive stories about how he had transcended the limitations of time and was able to do this, that, and the other in his life, and he was pitching this ideology to us. In the process of that conversation, he mentioned in passing that it had been years since he opened his Bible. He doesn't even bother with that anymore because if he wants to know something, he just goes to heaven and then he goes on the timeline wherever he wants to go to find out what he wants to find. That was a yellow flag for me. Um, discarding the whole Bible is irrelevant is hmm, not a real big sales pitch for me. But then as we begin to explore other areas, there were significant issues in his life that were utterly dysfunctional that he admitted in passing. And I'm saying, hmm, second yellow flag. Why, if you have such good revelation from your time travel, can't you find answers to your own life? And why should I follow you as my guru if, we have these internal contradictions. So those three issues. Number one, the poverty spirit. I'm very, very cautious of how people solve problems with their Christianity isn't working for them. Secondly, the congruence. If we're moving towards God, we should be becoming more and more congruent in our lives with the existing theology of the body of Christ. 
And number three, <laughs> how's it working out for you? What's the fruit in your life? Because that is the ultimate test. Jesus Christ was very, very clear. By their fruit shall you know them, not by their statement of faith, by their fruit. He repeated that. He was clear. There's no question that there was supposed to be fruit in the lives of the people who named the name of God. So against that backdrop, let's circle back to David and to our own walk. And I have framed the issue of being on the cutting edge, being a trailblazer, around two boxes. In order to be a trailblazer, in order to embrace new revelation, you simply have to be a rebel. Let's look at my own walk. The big breach with established religion came in the 1980s when the idea of believers having demonic attachments was not open for discussion. Everybody knew that a Christian could not possibly have a demon. It was all resolved at the cross. There was no generational covenants, no generational curses, and certainly no demonic attachments to believers. Everybody knew that. It was established dogma. There was no question, no debate. It was nothing to explore. And the fruit of deliverance in people's lives was not admissible to the discussion. And many individuals, like myself, looked at the established dogma looked at the fruit of the deliverance that we were doing and said, we're going to disagree. And it was an extraordinary act of rebellion for me and others like me to stand up and say, I am more right about how God is working than these thousands of people in the ministry who are adamant that Christians can't have a demon. There is no other way to frame that than rebellion. I was so sure that I was right, more right than thousands of people who had massive theological education I did not have, who had walked with God a long time. That's an extraordinary level of chutzpah. And in David's case, he was well aware that Saul was anointed as king. He was well aware that he was anointed as king. He was well aware that there was a clash between the two views and that at some point in time, God was going to remove Saul and replace Saul with him. And for him to be public enemy number one, for him to rebel against Saul as king while Saul was alive, to leave the palace and his assignments there and to become the leader of a guerrilla band, that's rebellion. There's no other word for it. And to move the ball in the kingdom of God with this new revelation requires a willingness to have a huge number of enemies from the keepers of the ancient way. Today, 40, 50 years later, there are still those who believe Christians cannot have a demon, but the vindication of the position that I took 45 years ago is immense. There are millions of people in the body of Christ who are actively doing deliverance. There's tens of millions of people that are actively seeking deliverance. They're believers, they have the Spirit of God within them, and there's some demonic attachment, whether it's a generational covenant or a curse or a structure or a device or a critter, and... I have been vindicated, but at the time I was a rebel. Now, here's the problem. When you embrace a mindset of rebellion against the keepers of the ancient way, rebellion against the political institution, the religious institution, or whatever structure exists in the culture, it is extremely challenging to stay within the bigger box of God's parameters and not rebel against God. And that is what David more or less succeeded to doing. He rebelled against Saul and Nabal and the king of the Philistines. He was a rebel, but when it came to the larger box of God's parameters, he refused to be the one that would kill Saul, taking matters into his own hands. And that 
is an amazing art form. To be on the cutting edge, to be a trailblazer, to move beyond the norms of the culture while staying firmly within the box of God's parameters, God's metrics, God's absolutes. Many years ago, I recorded a teaching about these two boxes, and we have cleaned up the audio and are re-releasing it and you'll see a link to that in the description below this video. It's time for us to take a critical look at the mystic movement and say yes here, no there. It's time to measure those who are not only leaving the established box, but also moving outside the parameters of God's metrics. And I present this without any names, not pointing the finger at any of the mystics. I'm simply saying we are in a stream of revelation that is amazing. The enemy is doing everything he can to contaminate it and co-opt it. And each one of you has to look at your own life and say, I'm disagreeing with this stream of the faith, but staying within the parameters that God has established, and to look outside at those from whose streams you drink to be sure that they're still within the big box of God's parameters, even though they're doing unusual, unconventional things. Are they driven by poverty spirit? Is what they're teaching congruent with a larger, time-tested message of the body of Christ? And where's the fruit? Particularly the last one. The reason I'm doing this is because there's too many people within SLG that are listening to the mystics, following the mystics, getting messed up, coming to me, and insisting that I help them fix their lives while they hold on to the error from the mystics. Um, no. Where there's error, it has to be released. Because we cannot build on a flawed foundation. I'm a rebel against the box created by the keepers of the ancient way. No question. And I receive revelation from God, or say I do. And I am passionate about the revelation of God lining up, being congruent with the word of God, and I'm continually checking my life. Where's the fruit? Where am I compared to 10 years ago, five years ago, one year ago, three months ago? I'm continually saying, is my Christianity working for me? Because that's the metric. By their fruit shall you know them, not by their claims of revelation from Moses or Elijah or whoever, wherever, whenever. Be wise. It is your responsibility when you stand before heaven to justify who you listen to, when and where and why. It's not going to work for you to say, but he said he received revelation from. It's on you to filter what you receive from whom and to verify that it's congruent and that it's transformation in your life. Measurable verifiable, sustained change. By their fruit shall you know their theology.